Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the GeoParsi Friday Forum today. GeoParsi is, is a government scheme sponsored by the Ministry of Minority Affairs to arrest the population decline in the Parsi Zoroastrian community in India. 
A major part of the GeoParsi scheme is the advocacy component, where we like to work with questions like why the, Geo why the Parsi Zarasan community needs to be studied and saved, why their heritage needs to be preserved, and how you can contribute. While the pandemic has restricted us physically, these virtual events have opened a lot of doors, more like windows, and allowed us to bring you Parsis from different walks of life to discuss how they have contributed to their respective fields of work. Joining us today is Dr. Kumi Vevaina, education futurist, TEDx speaker, internationally acclaimed educator, literary critic, writer, and storyteller. In 2016, she retired as professor and head of the Department of English, University of Mumbai, and is now the founder director of the Center for Connection, Education, and Management. She has two PhDs to her credit, one each in literature and education. She has published 11 books and 58 papers. She has been working to transform education and learning and will be taking us through a wonderful world of evolutionary narratives today. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Vaivina. Over to you. Thank you very much. Am I audible? Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Gia Parsi. I'm delighted and honored by the invitation. And without much ado, let's start, get into the wonderful world of storytelling and see the value and the purpose of storytelling in today's world. My presentation today is called Sherazad Reborn. The Arabic pronunciation would be Sherazade, but we are going to call it Sherazad, which is a more anglicized pronunciation. Sherazad Reborn, telling tales for survival. So, let's begin. I have three questions for you, and perhaps you can type your answers in the chat box. Have you heard of this literary character called Sherazad? I'll pause. I'll wait for the answers. Kritika, you can tell me if people respond. Sure, I'll do Has that. Has anyone heard? Anyone heard of Sherazad? Do we have any responses coming? Uh, not yet. Could you repeat your questions for those who just joined us? Sure, sure. Have you heard of the literary character Sherazad? We've got, we've got a yes. All right, great. Which story revolves around her? I think we're getting mixed responses. Some people know her, some don't. All right. Is there anyone at all? Yeah, a few. The third question is redundant. OK, so let me tell you the story of Sherazad. King Sheriar was married to a wife whom he was absolutely in love with. Unfortunately for him, his wife was disloyal to him. So he was furious and he went against women, but in a rather crazy way. He decided that he would marry a virgin every single night and the next morning she would be beheaded so that she had absolutely no time to be disloyal to him. This happened night after night. A virgin was brought to him. He married her and the next morning off with her head. The visor of the the Darbar was supposed to be providing the king with these women. One day, his daughter went up to him and said, Father, I want to be the next wife. And the father was shocked. He said, are you crazy? You know your fate. She said, never mind. Don't worry. Get me married to the king. And she got married to the king. She began telling a story. There are two accounts. In one account, she started telling the story to her sister who was in the same room as them. In the other account, she started telling the story to King Sheriyar. 
And she spun a long tail and the night went on. And at dawn, she stopped short and she said, all right, king, go ahead and kill me. And the king said, no, but you haven't finished your story. She said, too bad. You normally king, uh, kill us early morning. This happened and the king realized that he really, really wanted to know the end of the story. Doesn't this happen to all of us? If a story stops halfway through, we are ever so curious to know the end. And this is exactly what the king felt. So he let her live on. He said, all right, I'll give you one more night. And then one more night and one more night. And it happened for a thousand and one nights. By then, he fell in love with her. He had three children. He became a kinder human being. And Sherazad survived. And the women in the country stopped getting beheaded. Very interesting narrative. Stories are for survival. Let's see if there is any truth in this statement. So at the outset, I would like to map the session and tell you how I'm going to proceed. Section one, we will look at the question, do we need stories in a STEM dominated world? I think most of you would know what STEM is. Science, technology, engineering, math. They seem to be prioritized everywhere. As against the humanities. Question two, why do we need to be like Sherazad and tell stories? Question three, what are evolutionary narratives? And question four, how can evolutionary narratives empower us and make us sourcefully intelligent? If you don't understand this term sourcefully intelligent, no worries. It will be clear very soon. So let's begin with part one. Do we need stories in a STEM dominated world? Let's start with a fun exercise, as I call it. Imagine that there are three, seven, five and eight year old kids around you. And you are supposed to teach them about the importance of self-discipline. You have done your research and you've come up with these bullet points that if you are self-disciplined, then it's a good habit, things get done, it helps us to focus, it boosts our self-esteem and work ethics, helps us to achieve mastery and become the best version of ourselves. Now you try very hard to get these little kids to learn and memorize these points, but you are not successful. After a while, they are weary, you are weary, and you decide, to tell them a story instead. Let's listen to the story. The day the rooster slept late. Fred the red rooster and speckle hen rose were dancing till midnight on tip tapping toes. They tangoed, fadangoed beneath the bright moon. They box step and two step while Fred hummed a tune. It's time you'd be sleeping, said Rose with a dawn, for you must rise early and wake up the dawn. Let's dance one more jig, Rose. We're having such fun, swirling and twirling. They danced up to one. Next morning, no morning. The sun didn't show, for Fred was too tired to wake up and crow. The sun slept on soundly. The sun didn't know that it should be rising for Fred didn't crow. The hens softly slumbered, the ducks and the sheep, the farmer, his family and the dog stayed asleep. At noon, the farmer jumped out of his bed. He looked at his clock and went looking for Fred. And all of the others awakened by now, the family, the dog, the goose and the cow, the chickens, the piglets, the hens and the sheep, the ducks and the donkeys found Fred fast asleep. Fred was embarrassed. He knew there and then he never would let this thing happen again. 
Now, Fred still goes dancing with speckle hen Rose, but he sets an alarm. So he wakes up and crows. All right. So this is the story. Which of the two versions do you think was more interesting? Which of the two versions do you think they'd remember better? Needless to say, it would be the second, the story. Every effective teacher and orator knows the truth in this Native American proverb. Tell me the facts and I'll learn. Tell me the truth and I'll believe. But tell me a story and I will live it in my heart. So those six boring points of self-discipline are all covered in an enjoyable way. And all of us naturally prefer the story to the facts. So the point I wish to make here is that though in our STEM dominated world, we may not think of the humanities and the arts as important. It is only the humanities and the arts which will prevent technology from trumping humanity. In order to be a whole, W-H-O-L-E, a whole human being, we definitely need the arts and the humanities alongside STEM. We human beings are compulsive storytellers. Contemporary neuroscience tells us that the left side of our brain, which is called the interpreter, is the source of the familiar internal narratives that we all experience. And you know, there is so much of chattering that goes on and on endlessly in our heads. Let me give you an example. A lot of these stories may not be true. For instance, instead of this digital seminar today, if we were face to face, you would see me, I would see you. Next day morning, I meet you at the bus stop and I just walk past you. And you think to yourself, well, she was very friendly yesterday, but actually I think she's a bit of a snob. The second day, something worse happens and I cross the road and I walk away from you simply because I haven't recognized you. But the internal storyteller will tell you, oh, she is terribly snobbish. She only pretends to be friendly, but in fact, she isn't. On the third day, however, you're about to fall and I prevent that fall. What happens? Something rewires in your brain and you realize that all the stories that you made up were not true. Doesn't this happen to us all the time? We are compulsive storytellers and biologically so. The most important idea that you need to take home from today's session is that we human beings live by narratives which shape our entire reality. Dr. Anne Quinn, who is a very, very well-known sports psychologist, actually trains sports persons with stories. Joseph Campbell, one of the greatest mythologists the world has ever seen, very pertinently observes our myths are our reality. However, in popular parlance, when we use the word myth, we mean a lie. No. Myths are spiritual clues to the way we live. Our myths are our reality. The stories that we've heard as little children have conditioned our thinking. I'll come to that in a moment again, but keep this thought in mind. Not only at the individual level, even at the collective level, there seems to be currently a crisis of narratives. Entire civilizations, cultures live by narratives. In his very powerful book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, Yuval Noah Harari very interestingly observes that the 20th century saw the rise and fall of four powerful narratives, imperialism, communism, fascism, and liberal democracy. 
Obviously, out of the four, the most desirable was liberal democracy. But there were cracks and niches even there, and it seems to have unfortunately fallen apart. In the 21st century, artificial intelligence, IOTs, and biotechnology brought in a new story called the biotechnological democracy. And it made us feel that we can all be equal, we can all share information. This new story was on the verge of being born when the pandemic struck. This brings us to part two. Why do we need to be like Sherazad and tell stories? Simply to choose the kind of life we want to live. If our basic necessities are fulfilled, then all of us, without exception, can choose to live the life we want to live. Let me once again illustrate that with a very beautiful story of a Zen master and a samurai warrior. One day, a Zen master and his disciple, a samurai warrior, were walking through the forest. And the samurai warrior turned to his master and said, Master, I'm still confused. I'm not clear about the concept of heaven and hell. Where is heaven? Where is hell? The master looked him in the eye and said, Oh, dear, a lout like you can't possibly understand what is heaven and what is hell. This infuriated the warrior and he unsheathed his sword. Very quietly, the master said, this is hell. The samurai warrior understood. Very reverentially, he put the sword back into the sheath, bowed to his master, and his master said, that is heaven. Heaven and hell are within. And again, it's a question of choice. You break your leg and you can say, oh, my God, why did this happen to me? How unfair of the cosmos, whatever, whatever. And you get into that self-pitying spiel. Or you can say, well, maybe it's time for me to relax and do other things. The choice is always ours. That is the power of words. That is the power of narratives. The bard of Stratford-upon-Avon Shakespeare in his play Hamlet very correctly observes, there is nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Whatever happens is neutral. We color it the way we want. We can regard it as good, we can regard it as bad. The choice is entirely up to us. Gandhiji likewise observed that to live the life we want, we need to change our perception, just a slight shift, because your perceptions become your beliefs, your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become your values, and your values become your destiny. So, to change our destiny, we merely need to change our perception. And what does storytelling do? Stories allow us to see a particular situation in diverse ways. We know that words are extremely powerful, for words create thoughts, and those are the images that form in our brain. These images translate into body chemistry, which goes through the blood in our body and informs our cells and tells our cells how to act. We have all experienced seeing a horror film and feeling a chill going down our spine. We respond biologically to words and to images. Therefore, if the creators of computer games and video games, which are violent, ever turn around and tell us, well, it's only done for fun, everyone knows it's fiction, sorry, it has a tremendous effect on those who participate in it. 
science tells us that our unconscious mind is almost entirely formed in the last trimester in our mother's womb and up to the age of seven entire unconscious and very interestingly after the age of nine we are almost fast asleep on the wheel of our car we operate on autopilot with 95 percent of our thoughts and behavior being controlled by the unconscious and only five percent by the conscious so do you realize how important it is to tell the right kind of stories to children when they are really young with that, we move on to the third part. What are evolutionary narratives? These are stories which facilitate a transition, a movement from caterpillar consciousness to butterfly consciousness. What does a caterpillar do? Eat, 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 greedy little caterpillar, me and mine alone. This is the kind of attitude that our consumer society has encouraged the cap caterpillar consciousness. But we need to die to being caterpillars, to be reborn as butterflies, free and soaring. This is a diagram given by one of the greatest contemporary thinkers, Ken Wilber. Most of us think in extremely egocentric terms. He calls this ego, egocentric intimacy. From egocentric intimacy, when we expand our consciousness a little bit, we move to ethnocentric intimacies. We, our group of people, our community, our friends, so that's the ethnocentric intimacy. From there, we could move to nation-centric intimacy world-centric intimacy, and finally, cosmocentric intimacy. This is the way we normally move from the inside out. But with the help of powerful evolutionary stories, we could reverse this. We could start seeing ourselves as spirit first, belonging to the world next, belonging to the nation, belonging to our ethnic groups, Finally, ourselves, male, female, whatever. When this consciousness changes, the world can be extremely different from what we see it today. Jiddu Krishnamurti, one of the greatest thinkers in India, talked about the need for a revolution in consciousness. And that comes only from understanding ourselves as a total process. He feels that by understanding ourselves, we can bring about lasting peace. And this is the only revolution we need to work towards. Extremely powerful, way back in 1975. Yuval Noah Harari more recently says that a change in consciousness is more necessary now than ever before. And that for every dollar or rupee that we spend on technology, the next dollar or rupee should be spent on changing consciousness. I have been talking about evolutionary narrative. So let's get this idea of evolution clear. Contrary to what Darwinians imagine, evolution is not indicated by the increase in the number of genes. The genome project rubbish this entirely but in higher levels of awareness and peaceful collaboration. This is extremely powerful. What the world needs today is peaceful collaboration. Only then can we move to the next evolutionary stage from Homo sapiens to Homo amor. However, we have a lot of devolutionary tales around us we need to engage with these disempowering, limiting devolutionary narratives rooted in ideas of separation and violence. 
Today, there is a lot of fear among young parents who feel that they should not be telling their children stories about Cinderella and Snow White and all the traditional stories because the traditional stories valorize the wrong values. What are they saying? It's extremely important to be youthful, extremely important to have the right body dimensions, the right kind of face, the right kind of skin color, and a lot of wealth. Now, obviously, these are not the kind of values we want to see in our children. But my question is that do we throw out the baby with the bathwater? No. As storytellers, my storytellers of Wordfully Yours and I, we engage the children in dialogue. We talk about these stories. We don't censor these stories, but we deal with them in very critical ways. With that, we come to the fourth part of the presentation today. How can evolutionary narratives empower us and make us sourcefully intelligent? Number one, they help us develop the three literacies. I'll come to the three literacies in a moment. Number two, ensure mental health and emotional balance by nurturing character strengths and the 21st century skills and three equip us to achieve the sustainable development goals that the united nations have given us evolutionary stories can literally help us develop this kind of butterfly consciousness and make us sourcefully intelligent. Now I've used the word sourcefully intelligent far too often. I'll explain that. In my book, which came out in 2013, I coined this term sourceful intelligence and subsequently have been using it for my teaching and lecturing. Sourceful intelligence is the dual capacity that we human beings have of understanding our uniqueness and our oneness if you look at this diagram the upper layers of our mind show that we are different obviously i'm different from you my life experiences are very different from yours but at the deeper level we are one that is why we can appreciate the culture of others we can appreciate the stories the literature dance music because they all come from a deeper level of consciousness. The, with, with the help of evolutionary narratives, we can transition our young people from a self versus other consciousness to a self and other consciousness to an all is self consciousness. Your all is self is a butterfly consciousness. Does it always have to be me versus you? But right from the beginning, with stories like Snow White, we've been taught to think of mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest of them all? Who cares who is the fairest? But this becomes a part of our unconscious thinking where fair is beautiful. However much we may be told, dark is beautiful, black is beautiful, somewhere at the back of our mind, it's still fair is beautiful. Just one example, self versus other consciousness constantly encourages competition and consumer society wants that. A while ago, there was an Alpen Liebe uh, advertisement. In that advertisement, each one who finds the candy just pops it in his or her mouth. No one thinks of sharing, ruffles lays, a fat man sits next to a little boy and the little boy is munching away on his chips and the fat man says, please, may I have one? And he says, no, get your own bag. What do these advertisements do? They create in us the self versus other consciousness, which comes from competition. How much competition do we need? A little bit, as much as salt and food. But when we put a dollar, everything gets corroded. So moving from a self versus 
con other consciousness to a self and other, which is collaboration. I have a few things to share, and so do you. And sharing and collaboration is what it's all about. Yet, even in this position, the other remains separate from yourself. Without getting into details, quantum physics and ancient wisdom have both talked about a common matrix, the universal matrix where all is self. So evolutionary stories help us develop three literacies, psycho-literacy, which is self-awareness, socio-literacy, which is other awareness, and geo-literacy, which is earth awareness. There are umpteen books today in the market, and we can choose from any. These are just some of my favorites and could fit into the slide. And there is no time to tell you stories of each of these. But each of these stories makes us self-smart. I'll give you one example from the balloon farmer. The balloon farmer is a surrealistic story in which the farmer grows balloons. And little children will not really sit and question that. This is magic realism at its best. And one day, all the balloons fly away, and he's really unhappy, and he's really depressed. But then an idea comes to him, and he starts growing feathers. This is such a powerful story. When, as storytellers, we tell it to groups of children and ask them if something has not worked out for them, have they been able to think of something else which is better? Inevitably, the children come up with amazing ideas. So psycho-literacy, understanding yourself. Tiger, tiger is a true. We all lapse into self-pity when things don't work for us. Why me? Why me? That's what little tiger says. Till little turtle helps him to understand himself better. So there are amazing stories available in the market which really nurture psycholiteracy. With that, we move on to socioliteracy. When, when we tell these kind of stories, we need to create a healthy mix of mirror stories, window stories, and sliding glass stories. I'll explain that in a minute. Rudine Sims Bishop of the Ohio State University talked about this and has given us his division. Mirror narratives. Mirror narratives reflect our own culture and help us build our identity. Very useful, very important. We need to know stories that come from our culture, our religion, etc. However, as Chinmaya Adichie very pertinently warns us in a brilliant TED talk called The Danger of a Single Story, single stories show a people as one thing over and over again, and that is what they become. So stories of the past may be useful, but if overdone, they get crystallized and you form your identity based on them, which is not entirely desirable. A single story robs people of dignity because that is when you start imagining that your group of people happen to be superior to all others. And as she powerfully says, stories have been used to dispossess, to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and humanize. Window narratives, the next. Window narratives offer us a view into the lives of others. There is this charming story called Bebel Bean and Bebel Boo. I'm giving you illustrations from children's stories, but the same could be done with literature, and I've done it personally. I've done courses on how management principles can be done through the understanding of Shakespeare's plays. So, However, in this presentation, I'm keeping to children's narratives. Bebel Bean and Bebel Boo is a classic narrative where there are two groups of people and there is a huge wall that they built because they hate each other. 
the beaver beans hate the beaver goose because they have green ears and while they have blue ears and they have a little hair on their toes whereas these people have no hair on their toes and they instill this hatred and fear in their children and the children also start believing that the others are wicked till one day a little beaver bean with nothing much to do takes a ball and throws it over the wall and a beaver bean catches it and then they play ball across the wall and they promise to bring a friend the next day the next day two beaver beans and two beaver boos play ball and then as the story goes more and more children go to the ball to play so the adults become angry and nervous and they say how can you play with people we don't like and the the response of the children is oh they laugh a lot and so do we they decide to bring down the wall and they do and the story ends with where a wall stood high and tall bright flowers grow today and beaver bean and beaver boo are happier this way because they realize that all the differences were really very small what a powerful and beautiful story the third kind of story is a sliding glass narrative the sliding glass door type of narrative is when readers can navigate empathetically and experience the reality of others i'll tell you a very quick story all of you have heard about the three little pigs well we've heard about the story given to us by the three little pigs what about the big bad wolf story he too has a story so for the next few minutes imagine me as a big bad wolf okay friends you've heard the story of three little pigs it's time you heard my story because actually i was framed i had moved to a new neighborhood and i had everything with me to celebrate the birthday of grandma gorgias and i decided to bake a cake i realized to my utter amazement that i thought i had everything but not sugar imagine cake without sugar so i took a little empty pot and went to my neighbor's house and said little pig little pig please may i come in and the pig said not to bother hair of my chinny chin chin i said then i'll huff and i'll puff and i'll blow your house in i didn't really mean it i just wanted to frighten the guy he died of a cardiac arrest now being an ecologically sensitive wolf i couldn't leave the carcass there to rot so i had to eat him up but i still needed the sugar so i went to the next house and i knocked and i said little pig little pig please may i come in he was even more rude than his brother and he said no 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 i'm not by the hair of my chinny chin chin i repeated the same dialogue he got so scared he tried to rush out of the back door the back door wouldn't have opened and his house of sticks fell on him and he too died and being an ecologically conscious wolf i had to eat him up but i still needed the sugar so i went to the third house this pig was really wily i didn't even suspect the treachery he said oh i i can't open my front door do you mind coming in from the chimney i went in through the chimney and look 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 at the burns on me they are still there on me i fell into a pot of boiling water i was furious i rushed at him i killed him and i ate him up i was about to leave when i heard some squealing from a corner and i realized there were four little piglets there what did i do eat them up oh no i adopted them i told you i'm a good hearted wolf they are brats they scream and they shout and they bring the neighbors in the neighbors call me cunning cunningham but i've changed my name to caring cunningham because i look after them so next sunday it's grandma gorgeous's birthday again 
This time I have the sugar and I invite you to the party. What does the story do? It tells us that your truth needn't be my truth. And there are always different versions of the truth. This makes our thinking really nuanced rather than simplistic. And empathy is what the world badly needs today. The third kind of literacy is geoliteracy, awareness of the earth. Once again, I would love to tell you these narratives, but unfortunately there isn't much time. In the market, there are numerous books which really teach us about geoliteracy as well. Moving on, evolutionary narratives ensure mental health and emotional balance and 21st century skills. Even the most disturbing situations can be dealt with from an evolutionary perspective. And today we have a host of very, very powerful narratives written by the best of writers dealing with traumas and with emotional imbalances. So these kind of narratives help develop character strengths and they are an antidote to learn helplessness. According to positive psychologists, Martin Seligman and Christopher Peterson. This diagram is interesting. You may not be able to see it, but I think it would be worth your while to look at their work. Very often we seem to say, well, I can't help it. This is the way things are. This is learned helplessness with the 24 character strengths that these positive psychologists talk about and the six virtues, all of which can be taught through evolutionary narratives, we could make our children really strong and resilient. Though all are important in our pandemic and post COVID world, the two most important character strengths we need for our survival are deep compassion through empathy grit and resilience with a growth mindset. The Dalai Lama is a familiar figure. He is talking about the need for compassionate leadership in the world. And the other person here is Daniel Goleman, the author of Emotional Intelligence, Social Intelligence, who talks repeatedly about the importance of empathy. Grit and resilience and a growth mindset. Angela Duckworth's work, when she talks about the need for grit in children, inspiring grit in children, is noteworthy. Similarly, Car Carol Dweck talks about a growth mindset. Some of you may want to check them out. Both of them are excellent TEDx speakers, and they have books which are worth your while reading. Evolutionary narratives. Powerful stories encourage and nurture all 21st century skills, which are the skills, critical thinking, creative thinking, change orientation, compassion and empathy, collaboration and communication excellence, all. When we listen to a story, we are dissecting, we are analyzing with our critical intelligence. We bring the ideas together. We're creatively imagining worlds, imagining the characters. Therefore, I always tell parents, don't show them the movie first and then go to the book. Let their imagination get fired by the words and then go to the movie. So when we are doing storytelling, we are encouraging children to dissect and dissipate in order to recreate. And all 21st century skills are honed by storytelling. One of the most powerful evolutionary stories that I know is a paperback princess written by the Canadian writer Robert Munch. And I'll illustrate it. I'll tell you the story. Once upon a time, there was a not so beautiful princess whose name was Elizabeth. And she was to marry a prince named Ronald. But one day, a big dragon came and with his fiery breath burned the entire castle and took away Prince Ronald. Everything was charred. 
Elizabeth couldn't even find clothes to wear. The only thing she found under a rock was an old paper bag. So she wore that and she went to the dragon's cave and she knocked at the door and she said, hey, dragon. The dragon stuck his nose out and said, mm, a princess. I love to eat princesses, but I'm a very busy dragon. I've eaten a whole castle today. Come back tomorrow. Elizabeth said, wait, dragon. I have heard that you are the most fierce dragon in the whole world. Is this true? And the dragon said, of course, it's true. And he blew out so much fire that he burnt up 100 tons of garbage. Fantastic, fantastic. Do it again, said Elizabeth. And this time he blew out so much fire, he burnt up 25 tons of garbage. But Elizabeth didn't stop. She said, wow, dragon, do it again. But this time, the dragon didn't have enough fire to cook a meatball. Elizabeth then said, dragon, is it true that you're also the fastest dragon in the whole world? And he said, yes, I am. She said, prove it. So the dragon ran all around the world and he came back in 20 minutes. Fantastic, fantastic, said Elizabeth. Do it again. The dragon did it again. He came back in an hour. He was very tired and he wanted to lie down. But Elizabeth said, no, dragon, just once again, and I'll declare you the fastest in the world. So the dragon got up and he came back after three hours. The dragon was so tired that he lay down and fell off to sleep. Elizabeth picked up his ear and shouted in his ear, hey, dragon. The dragon couldn't move an inch. So she reached into his pouch. She took out the key and she went and rescued Prince Ronald. Ronald looked at her and said, boy, your hair is a mess and your clothes are st stupidly dirty. Come back to me when you are dressed like a real princess. Oh, Elizabeth said, Ronald, your clothes are clean, your hair is well parted, but you're a bum. And they didn't get married happily ever after. Why do I call this a very powerful evolutionary narrative? Elizabeth does not indulge in swashbuckling or in killing. She outwits the dragon. So can we teach our children to do that? At our storytelling sessions, we tell our children to come up with alternative endings and tell them, don't bring in violence. Violence is a resort of the coward. So don't bring in violence. And they come up with amazing endings. So it is for us to teach our children to be nonviolent by and large. Among the many things that the pandemic has taught us is though we maintain social distancing and stay apart, we need each other and can transition out of the destruction caused by the virus only by functioning in collaborative ways. Only then can these beautiful 17 sustainable goals designed by the United Nations be a reality. Otherwise, they only remain on our wish list. We don't want that to happen, do we? Having said that, we need to scrutinize all narratives, all stories, because no language is neutral. The minute I use language, I have an agenda in my choice of words. So we need to revision the disempowering devolutionary narratives, but we also need to critically review empowering evolutionary narratives and counter narratives, such as the paper backwind says, which might promote millenarian discourse. What is millenarian discourse? The feeling that me and my group and my people and my country will redeem the world. We don't want that anymore. So we should be very careful even when we are looking at evolutionary narratives. So every single one of us can contribute to this change, just like the hundredth monkey story tells us. 
This story is rooted in fact. Anthropologists on different islands in Japan were observing monkey behavior. And on one particular island, there was this little leader whom the scientists called Emo. The scientists would give her and the group sweet potatoes in order to befriend them. And one day she took the sweet potato, washed it and popped it in her mouth and it tasted nicer without the mud and brine. So all her little friends started imitating and the whole monkey colony, you'd say no big deal. This is simple imitative behavior. But interestingly, what happened is that on other islands in Japan, all monkeys started washing the sweet potatoes. Rupert Sheldrake, the scientist, explains this with his morphic field theory. Very simply put, if a certain number of people, say anywhere from 5 to 25 percent, repeat a certain thought or gesture, it becomes a part of the collective consciousness. So every single person who is online today can bring about this change. Metaphorically, you may be the first monkey, 21st monkey, 58th monkey, and when the 100th monkey repeats this, we can bring about a change. We don't have to think of ourselves as powerless. And what easier way than by telling stories? So thank you very much for deciding to play Sherazade and telling stories and helping build the critical mass because that is what will make humanity live happily ever after. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumi, for that brilliantly engaging session. We've got lots of comments and questions coming in. Um, I'll take up a few here. Uh, we've got Mr. Anand Varadarajan asking, if learning is narrative based, why is the education system based mainly on rote? Well, that's an excellent question, but not every uh, educational system. In the Montessori system and in the Rudolf Steiner system, things are taught with the help of stories. Unfortunately, there is a belief that it's mere fiction, but this fiction is based on fact. We wouldn't care for story. We wouldn't be able to identify with nymphs and fairies and pixies if they did not in some way replicate human behavior. They do. So if our attitude towards stories changes, what can we not do with stories? We can do anything with stories. And I absolutely agree that if the educational system brings in more stories, I'll give you a very interesting example. I have a friend who is a hardcore scientist with Baba Atomic Research Center. And on each of the elements, the chemistry elements, you know how impossible they were for us to mug? On each of the elements, he's written a story. And every single student remembers a story. So I absolutely agree with you that education should usher in more stories. Thank you. Uh, we've got another question from him. Uh, does narrative drive our cognition? Most definitely. Not only cognition, but also our feelings, emotions, which are all linked. So uh, I, I, in my presentation itself, I talked about how powerful thoughts can be and how by merely demonstrating the difference between heaven and hell, with the help of the emotions of the questioner, the Zen master could change his thinking, of course, most definitely. We've got a question from Meera Suresh. She asks if, uh, if you agree with what's said, that Tom and Jerry is a violent story for kids. <laughs> That's really interesting. It most definitely is. We think it funny. But I think you'll find it even more funny if I give you my own personal experience. As a kid, my mom used to take me to see the Tom and Jerry movies. And I used to cry buckets. And my mother didn't know why she had a stupid girl who would cry buckets. And I would only say, but why can't they be friends? Why do they just have to fight with each other constantly? Most definitely. You know, violence comes in many, many forms. 
and it subliminally affects us. We take on behavior patterns based on that. And Tom and Jerry, if you take my paradigm of sourceful intelligence, is completely rooted in a self versus other consciousness. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, we've got a follow up question uh, from Kriti. How can violent uh, narratives be changed when our collective consciousness is rooted in those narratives themselves? Who created it? We. So who can deconstruct them? We. Who can reconstruct them? We. It only requires right. collective will. But if we keep making excuses, if we keep saying, oh, our child has to live in a violent world, the world we have created is violent, then don't come back and say today's kids are violent. There's nothing wrong with today's children. It is we who bring them up on a diet of violence. And that is what they replicate. Small wonder. OK. Um, okay. Shamla Anand from our team, she asks, in today's world, with kids hooked on to all kinds of gizmos, how can storytelling be reintroduced? I'm so happy for this question. I'm so happy, and thank you, Shamla, for this question. Uh, we have done a lot of storytelling, and uh, we insist on making them extremely critical about violence. So even if we tell a traditional story, we ask the kids at the end of it, how could it be different? Children are hooked to their gizmos, but if there is an adult who is actually telling them an engaging story, believe me, they will choose the adult. We've been to various places, SNDT University in, in India, abroad, Jodhpur, we do it for the, at the Children's Festival. Never have we come across children who want to get back to their gizmos. Their parents are sitting with their gizmos in the next room, but they just say hi to their parents, rush to the washroom and come back. So it depends. See, one of the most important things that I tell parents when they come and ask me, that why is it that my child is not reading? My question is, how much are you reading? If the child, the child regards you as a role model, whether you like it or not, and if you tell the child that there is a fascinating world there and you can play around with it, you can change the stories, you can create your own stories, it's extremely empowering. And then when you tell children that the stories you've created, you can draw, you can make origami out of that. Children are with you. There is no problem with children ever. But if we give them gizmos, again, it's we. It's we who constantly feel, oh my God, my child is too much to tackle. Let the child sit quietly in front of the TV or the computer or his iPad, because that gives me time. Well, true, I know it's not easy, but if you could reserve a certain amount of day for storytelling, where there are going to be no gizmos and even you keep need to keep your phone aside, on, on off, completely switched off. This is our time together. To have fun believe me children respond to a human being far better than they respond to a gizmo thank you so much dr webina for your time and then from, sorry i want to add something from there you can even take them on to creative writing we've done that and when you lead them to creative writing it's extremely intoxicating to see your name in print now to see your name there uh, on the web as having created the story, having illustrated the story. So it just depends on how imaginative we are and how much time we are willing to give. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, Dina Setna's comment wonderfully sums up the session. She says, thank you for the wonderful information and her love for stories and storytelling has been re-endorsed. I think you've enthused all of us back into the world of stories. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. The pleasure has been mine. Thank you, everyone who joined in today. Uh,
for any more information you may need on GeoParc, please visit our new website. And do uh, remember to join in again at the same time next week. We've got a wonderful session with uh, Dadi Padamji, the pioneer uh, puppet theater artist.